Oh, oh no. Jeannie, I hung up on Chuck a little bit. You probably need to send an email and smooth that over. <laughs> All right. All right, dear friends. Thank you so very much. I'm just going to close this here. We don't need that in everybody's eyes here. Wonderful. Thank you all. So if you could just start with... Um, Hmm? Let's start with Jess. We'll st okay, Craig says we're going to start with Jess, which we can do. Uh, so if we could just have everybody start, please. We're going to ask you the same question that we asked our friends uh, from the John Schwark era. Please tell us briefly how you're connected to FVD and its history. When did you come? In what roles have you served? Uh, Jessica, please. Well, good afternoon. Uh, good morning, rather. Um, I just celebrated 10 years. So I came in July of 2013. I actually purchased, for those of you that remember the garage list sales we used to have, I purchased the chairs that I was interviewed in because I too had a six hour interview from John Schwark. Um, when Jerry came, he decided his office needed an update. He was a contemporary uh, furniture man. So those chairs were out and in the garage sale and I bought them. Um, I did come from a different city, so I was looking for an organization that met the same kind of mission and values that I was leaving in the Toledo, Ohio area, and I found that easily um, just visiting this campus, looking at the, the great quality and the beautiful vision they had, and I was glad to join. Ann. I'm Ann Barnes. Uh, I moved into Friendship Village in 2012, in February of 2012, um, and John Schwark was still here at that time, but Jerry took over shortly after that, and uh, um, what else am I supposed to say? I forget. That's, that's yeah. exactly what we were okay. hoping for, yep. Gene, please. Well, my association with Friendship Village came probably as far back as 2009 when my wife and I decided we wanted to start exploring the potential of being in a retirement community. Our first visit to the village was five years before we decided to actually move in. Moved in in June of 2014. Uh, it's been a marvelous experience. Uh, during that time, I'm a, I've been a resident. Um, thanks to Bob Bauer, it was fairly quick after I moved in that I was asked to be on the resident council. I served as the treasurer of something called the Village Store, which was kind of like River's Edge run by the residents until we decided that Don Paul should take it over from us because we couldn't get enough volunteers. So uh, it's been a marvelous run. Still love every minute of it. Thank you, Gene. Jerry, please tell us, uh, tell us about your time here and the role in which you served. Uh, Jerry Quiat served as executive director 2013 to 2018. I'll, I'll zip in just two real quick stories. Please. Since, uh, when Chuck Ansley said uh, John Schwark's parting gesture, when I walked in for my orientation, um, I had a list of 156 things I wanted to ask him. Okay? And he said, let's get started, and when we're done, there are your keys, and you are in charge. That says a little bit about the change of command. That's, that's how he did it. And I would say, Don Paul, um, John typically ate in his office. And so the first day, I'm in the dining room. And Don comes up to me afterwards and says, is this going to be a regular thing with you? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He says, are you going to eat here every day? My people need to understand what you expect of them. I said, yeah, I'm going to eat there every day. Oh, I love that. Craig. Uh, good morning, Craig Flickinger, Finance Director. And as I look down here, I think Jess came in July, Jerry, October, and I came in February of 14. So we were kind of in rapid succession there. I'll be here 10 years in February. And we're talking about interviews. As I think back to my first interview, uh, it was Jess and Jerry, 
Bob Bowers. Uh, Bob Kohler at the time was the, I think, board representative at the time, and then Beth Pack in HR, and it didn't take six hours, I don't believe, but uh, it did convince me after that probably one hour. Uh, I hope to get a call back, and it wasn't more than a couple days later. Jerry and I sat in his office and, and worked it out, and I guess the rest is 10 years of history. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, Jerry, we're going to go back to you for just a minute. Um, when you joined Friendship Village, what goals or plans did you envision for the facility and your tenure, and what plans were already in place? Well, I think the board had the desire, as uh, uh, Chuck Ansley had said, there was a long success of financial stability. And the idea was, how can we maybe reposition the campus to make sure that there's long-term viability? So m the board and I worked out a master plan that was to kind of refit the campus, uh, a significant number of additional two-bedroom apartments. Uh, the at-home program and the home care program were important to me because my belief has always been that the residents need to have access to a complete continuum so you can stay in your apartment. Uh, and the board was very supportive of those things. Uh, I do totally apologize that a five-year master plan turned into an eight-year <laughs> master plan. But uh, I, I would throw in one more uh, story. There was a um, uh, first day of construction. The electric line and the water line were both cut. And this is the only community I can think that we called a impromptu town hall meeting and when I told the residents that it would be fixed by 8 p.m. that night, after cutting their water and electricity, I got a standing ovation. Now, who gets a standing ovation when you cut people's services? Uh, which is just an example of the high quality of residents that are here. And um, I originally came here because of the fact that uh, the board had such a good reputation. We appreciate that so much, Jerry. Uh, friends, Anne and Jean, I'm actually going to ask you to kind of speak a little bit to the community that Jerry started to describe. Um, what about FVD's community made you want to be a part of it? Well, during that five years that Kay and I were exploring around, we visited a few other communities locally. <clears throat> and this is the one that seemed to have the vibrance we walk in and there's, there's people doing things, there's activity, there's things going on. Um, I had close connections with a local pastor who visited here frequently in the health center and always in, regarded as the, the best. And we, we just kept looking around and talking to people and decided that Friendship Village had the kind of qualities of, uh, we wanted the continuum of care, we valued the life care uh, contract very highly for long-term personal financial stability. So all those things, just the quality of the community, and from day one, I have never, never had any hesitation that it was the right decision. Anne, how about for you? Well, I knew almost nothing about Friendship Village, um, but I had a granddaughter who was an Irish dancer. And uh, she came here to perform several times, and I came to watch her perform. And I just was so impressed with the community that when I started thinking about what I wanted to do, I decided that I thought this was the right place for me. So, and I was right. So, <laughs> Jessica, will you tell us a little bit about the size and scope of licensed care when you came versus today? Sure. So when I was hired in 2013, um, no part of my six-hour interview with John Schwark included a tour of the community. So I was told, full transparency, there were 60 beds in our licensed health center. It was known as the health center at Friendship Village, but I had not lied, laid eyes on that operation until I started my first day. Um, for those that experienced the old health center, um, it had a wonderful reputation, a great star rating for quality, um, a stable staff. We, we still have staff members um, that were here when I got here that had already celebrated 5, 10, 15 years of good service. So the tenure was awesome. 
Uh, in 2016 July, we decided to sell 10 beds. So we moved from 60 beds to 50 beds. And that was um, for nothing less but to increase our private rooms because our old health center square footage was a lot smaller and um, almost the majority of our rooms were semi-private arrangements, which aren't desirable for recuperating or long-term care lifestyles. So our health center changed considerably and now uh, it's wonderful in Alderwood. We have space to do cartwheels across the room and bring, bring a whole house full of furniture and fixtures. So we've really evolved. Um, you've heard the Meadows Assisted Living. That was in the current place where Alderwood resides now. And that had 46 apartments with the capacity to serve 46 recipients for assisted living care. We have evolved that to a capacity of 72 licensed um, ability to serve 72 residents. And that's between 55 apartments and assisted living, the Waterford Place and Rowan House. So just a big big change in offering and it's all beautiful, bright and ready to care for people with the same piece of quality that our independent living exudes. Thank you so much, Jessica. Craig, can you talk about, so so you mentioned that, that Jessica came and then Jerry came and then just a few months later you joined. Um, help us understand what the financial picture of the Friendship Village of Dublin was when you came um, and what changes needed to occur. Yeah, so uh, part of the reason I think I'm here probably is my predecessor, I think Judy can confirm this in the back of the room, I think we were four months behind preparing financials and eight months behind in billing over in the health center. So there was a little interim period there thanks to Judy. I think a lot of that got caught up, but uh, actually the story I, I think I will tell is, and, and it was Jerry and I going into many a finance committee meeting with, with Chuck Ansley and Ron Bachman, another board member, and, and Dick Schrock were the three kind of stalwarts on the, on the board finance committee at the time. And, you know, as been mentioned, Friendship Village was strong financially before I came. But as we embark on the master plan, we've got this little thing called a Fitch A rating, which is only the top tier of uh, investment grade for folks in our space. And, you know, here's the new guy coming in and really two new guys coming in. And one of the first things we're going to do as part of the master plan is let's take these re this revenue offline and get downgraded. Well, here we go. But um, yeah, we, we were able to navigate through that. I think one of our proudest moments and is to look back at those 2016 early projections, taking revenue offline, selling 10 beds. And as we sit here in 2000, almost 24, 2023, to realize a lot of those early projections, we need a new health center, put this, these new beautiful Riverstone and flats and villas online, and to see how close those early projections turned out to be true now as we sit here eight, nine years later uh, with what we thought could happen. If, if Will the people come if we build it uh, to see it all come to fruition? So Craig, you maybe touched on this a little bit, but I'm gonna ask Jerry, um, what other challenges did FVD overcome during your tenure? Well, I wrote a few of those down. Uh, cost of construction, double digit inflation. That was the first one. Um, you know, dollars per square foot for construction was going up by 10% a year. So the original master plan was supposed to be $61 million and it was 81 uh, when it was completed. So it was, yeah, 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 yeah. I was trying to get off easy on that one. Um, the, the, for me, the, the most stressful thing, and it probably was for some of you, was your relocation. We relocated 64 independent living residents so that we could do uh, renovation work on apartments and also build uh, some new buildings. And we eventually had to move all the Meadows residents, all the healthcare residents. So it was the moving. The board tried really hard to make sure that the move was as painless as possible. But we are landlocked. I think we have 23 acres, sounds about right. And it was difficult to fit these new buildings in without having to ask you folks to move. So that was, that was a big one. And um, I think the other thing I would just mention is 
I think Andy is in the back, Andy Howland and uh, Craig, and just the number of people that were recruited during that time, plus Steve and Jeannie and the other folks who have just uh, excelled, getting that level of talent uh, really made, uh, made work easy. So. Thank you so much, Jerry. Uh, friends, this question is for everybody, and I'd like to start with Jessica here at the end. Um, it, can you just share one of your fondest Friendship Village of Dublin memories? I can. Um, lots in 10 years. Uh, this may come as a surprise because it's a, it's a fond memory, but it was also a, a tragic memory. But we removed somewhere between 50 and 75 trees one year. Jerry told me, I'm really going to need you out there in a hard hat. We've got people putting ribbons around trees. They, they had serious significance because they had been there forever, but some had memorial plaques on them. And Jerry was going across seas for a golf trip, and I had to be the person. And I remember really losing sleep for nights before that day, thinking I was going to have to peel people off of trees. <laughs> it was, a, it was a, a very emotional time, but I will say we, we um, repeated the phrase for many years, the, par the price of progress, right? And the price of progress was the community coming together with this optimistic connectedness to not forget about the past, but to move the vision forward and focus on the future. And um, those memories became very fond because of that for me. Thank you, Jessica. Anne, please. Well, I kind of have a little bit of a similar story. I was um, thinking in terms of how hard Andy worked to keep this campus looking as well as possible through that whole time period um, and doing a beautiful job. There was always somewhere to go that was beautiful, even through this whole period. So <laughs> It's hard to come up with one specific memory. There's just so many of them over the time that uh, and one comes to my mind is surprising myself. The quality of the community, the, the nature of this community. Even one of my brothers has told me that I'm a different personality than he remembers me being. I'm becoming, now people don't believe that I'm an introvert, which I am. Uh, I, I'm just, I'm different. But there's just so many things of moving in. Some of them were, one that my wife was able to take very, um, with great positivity and humor was something happened before we moved in. She spent three weeks in the health center for rehab, and it was in a cold this January. She noticed dripping water from the ceiling. It got worse. She called for help. Um, they got her out of the room down the hall, and as the firemen were coming in, because the leak was related to the fire systems, just as the firemen are coming down the hall, she said, Chicken Little said the ceiling, the, the sky is falling. <laughs> and as she said that, the ceiling of the room she had just been in collapsed. Whoa. It's just, it's nine years of wonderful memories that I can't <laughs> figure out what to do with. What a brilliant start. Jerry, please. Well, Jessica and I did not compare notes, but isn't it ironic that my fondest memory was the same story? It was a Friday. It's October. It's very raw outside. The trees are supposed to come out starting about 10 days from then. Um, I'm walking to my car. It's raining. It's 45 degrees, and there are two residents, each of them with plastic bonnets, and canes with a pile of yellow ribbons. And they said to me, have a nice weekend, Mr. Kouyat. <laughs> and what I loved about that was, you can tell us what to do, but we're gonna do what we think is right. And I always liked that about the Friendship Residence. <laughs> okay, Greg, do you have a favorite memory? Yeah, I'm, I don't think mine's gonna necessarily be as funny here. Um, <laughs> 
I mean, my, my fondest memories are of the Resident Finance Committee that, that continues to go on. And I, I think of all the relationships that, that I've been able to build over 10 years, or at least I think I've built over 10 years. Uh, and I probably shouldn't start naming names, but I'll at least name the three, the three folks who I've got to know pretty well because they've chaired it. And that's Bob Bowers, and I'm hoping Richard Belleville's here somewhere. And I know I see Paul Wright. There's Richard back there, and I've really gotten... And I guess the one little little quip on um, no matter what we presented, no matter what our investment portfolio did, the residents always stopped me in particular after. And it was almost, we had, it was always in the Kinsale at the time and we had to walk back to the front here and it was a, a steady stream of folks walking beside us telling us how poorly our investments were doing. <laughs> Whether we made 10% and we should have made 12 or we lost five and we should have only lost three, it didn't matter. Um, their portfolio was doing better than ours. <laughs> uh oh, oh my goodness. Well, friends, uh, uh, again, we are faced with the challenge of wanting to continue to hear from these folks, but we need to, to wrap up here. Um, I'm going to ask just one final question, and whoever feels inspired to answer it will hear from a few of you. Um, when you look at how FED has changed in the last five to seven years, versus the time that you first encountered the community, what is most surprising to you? I don't know what I'm going to say. Uh, surprising, maybe, maybe the hallmark of it is how we came through COVID. Yeah. We went through a tough time Rita and the leadership helped us to adjust to a horrendous situation, and we, we, we did it well. We did it with a good attitude. We came through as healthy as we could. Um, if there's one of the things I'm most thankful about was it was here when that happened. I, he stole my words. It definitely COVID. I never had a doubt that um, we weren't um, without big vision. Uh, that was clear when I came. I was set up for that with my interview with John Schwark, and Jerry put the plan in place, and we we hit some very rapid milestones. And with Rita, it's we don't take a breath. We check boxes and we put good things in place and we continue to move the vision forward. But COVID, um, that really solidified that we can, we can make anything happen here. We are different. Jerry, you maybe not have had a full opportunity to see all that has necessarily changed. She has, fantastic. So you can answer this question. What was most surprising to you coming back and, and seeing the changes over the last five years? I'm embarrassed to ask the question, what's the name of the new dining room? Legacy at Scioto, the, uh, the, yep, the big, mm -hmm. the big that one. That and, and the spa. I think the spa is something that, it, it, it's the things that aren't necessarily typical to all retirement centers. Um, you know, the pool that's been there for you know, 20 years now, but um, it's, it's really the remaking of the central core. Uh, that was not easy, I know. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's really kind of increasing the options for residents for dining um, and two fitness centers, you know, things that enable people to get there without having to uh, walk so far, so. Wonderful. Well, friends, can we please thank uh, our wonderful panel here, Jessica Reeker, Ann Barnes, Jean Cahal, Jerry Quiot, and Craig Flickinger. Thank you. And let's welcome our final group of panelists to the stage. Uh, please join me in welcoming Rita Doherty, Seth White, Angela Vogan, Dick Wood, and Barbara Herzog. Oh, hang on. That's not right. And Lois Meredith, my sincere apologies. I'm going to tell you a story about Lois while she's coming up. Lois had these fantastic leg warmers on this morning at the 8.30 fitness class. Uh, and I said, she showed up for this in a different outfit. And I said, Lois, where did your leg warmers go? And she said, well, I needed to be professional for this. And when I asked Jeannie if I needed to be professional for this, she said, no, no. You just keep your outfit on. So, <laughs> so we're ready for the 80s. All right.
we need fresh water bottles anywhere? Are we in good shape here? Angela, you need one. Okay. All righty. Well, friends, we're going to start this last group here the same way we started the other two. So tell us about when you came to friendship and the scope of your role or connection uh, to the community. Uh, Angela, let's start down there with you and we'll work towards me. Sounds good. Uh, I am the Human Resources Director. I came here what will be in a month, five years. Um, this community has grown since I've been here. So when I started, there were 268 employees and there are now 401. So that's a big increase. I'm Lois Meredith. I have been here for six years and I'm amazed at how much has happened in the six years that I've been here. It's just been surprising, overwhelming, and delightful. I'm Dick Wood, and I came here in, in 05. So I've been here 18 years, and I've enjoyed every minute of it, and I've had some ex ex really ex exceptional uh, relationships with people who live here. A lot of help from someone like Richard when I had some problems with computers, why I could call a guy like Richard, and he would come up and help me with those things. So. It's been fun. Morning, Seth White, Associate Executive Director here at Friendship Village of Dublin. I started in November of 2018. My connection to the village is sitting to the right of me. Um, for those of you that don't know, Rita and I went to college together and uh, graduated with the same degree. And she, we've been phone of friends for long-term care buddies for almost 20 years, so kept in touch, and uh, she called me up one day and said, I need some help at Friendship Village of Dublin, and we started the conversation of what that would look like, and um, it's been a great privilege to be here for almost five years, so. Morning. Uh, I started in March of 2018, so while Chuck says he's a math guy, we're working on six years, not five, but it's been a privilege. Thank you so much. Uh, for Rita, uh, when you joined Friendship Village, what goals or plans did you envision uh, for the facility and for your tenure? Well, I have to start with my interview since we're talking about interviews. Yep. And uh, I came, so for those of you who don't know, I worked for LCS for many, many years before, and Jerry and Eric Dudasco hosted me in now what is... I think Angela Vogan's office and Don was also in that suite. And we walk around and uh, Jerry's taking me on this great tour, telling me all about things. You know, as we all know, Jerry was a, a grader, A, B, C, D. Uh, so we were talking about all the people and how that was working. And then we go into Craig's office and Craig sits me down. And as you remember, I went to nursing school right before. And Craig asked me two questions, and Jerry was there. The first one is, do I drink the LCS Kool-Aid? Which will come back to haunt me. And the second one was, uh, you know, if it comes to quality or it comes to finance, where are you going to lean? Because, you know, Craig's wife is a nurse, and she doesn't really understand numbers the way he does, thankfully. So it was great. What was the question? <laughs> The question was, what goals or plans did you envision for the facility? Oh, gosh. Okay, this was part of it. So we're walking through, and Jerry's telling me about this master plan that the board and he have put together and how it's going to be $61 million, and it's going to be fine. And his, Jerry's biggest concern is about the, the power going out. Oh, my gosh. Little did we know we were going to be surviving this now almost nine-year master plan. So I think the vision really was to get through the master plan and figure out how to make it all work. Thankfully, Jer uh, John was, as we heard, frugal and was able to allow us to do this master plan that Jerry really put into works and, and designed for us and then we were able to kind of take that and run with it. So that was the vision. Seth, as an associate executive director, help us understand the scope of your position and the special projects that you've been working on the last almost five years. 
Oh, goodness. Um, really, just Reed and I are working together on where we needed to focus on operations. Um, I'd like to, I always say I'm an operations nerd at heart, so I don't want to bore you with too many things, but um, I think given all the changes with the master plan, we obviously had COVID. Um, I think a year into my tenure is when Rita asked me to really switch my focus to assist with licensed care, knowing that we we're opening three new buildings. That was before we even knew about COVID. Um, so I think that was good timing on Rita's part to get me involved at that point. And I'm just really proud of the work we've done with our team, given all the challenges with um, regulations and COVID, obviously. But from my perspective, I think the largest things I have worked on in, in my five years here of um, really just trying to implement some technology, um, anything paper-backed process-wise, putting that on a platform, increasing our exposure and our um, cadence of data-driven management, um, really driven, driving quality, um, satisfaction, and financial performance. So I put a lot of efforts in those areas, um, working alongside our team, and um, yeah, I'd say that'd be it. Thank you. Angela, you spoke a little bit to this in your introduction. So we've we've grown in size mm -hmm. uh, in terms of our employee population. Uh, tell us what else has changed in human resources over the course of the last five years. So when I was hired, there was a lot of conversation about efficiency. So Seth touched on process, right? What can we take that we're doing on a paperback process and really put into something that's easier to access, we can do faster. Little did we know that we would have to because of a worldwide pandemic, but we started a lot of that before we needed to. So we had that foundation. And then when we had a pandemic, we were able to adapt and be more nimble so that we could really reach you know, our associates so that they can continue to support our resident population. And then we learned so much more, so. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this question is actually for everybody, but I'd like to start with Lois and Dick uh, for this one. Can you tell us what do you love most about this community? I moved in and a friend of mine had said to me, do not stay in your apartment. If you want to be involved in the community, get out and make friends. Well, I went to a coffee clutch and someone said to me, do you like to volunteer? <laughs> Well, I'm now a floor rep for the Residence Council. I'm on spiritual care. I'm chair of the, of the program committee. I'm on the library committee. So I think the biggest thing for me here is that I have been, I can be involved. I have met so many wonderful people and wonderful friends. Thank you, Lois. Dick, how about for you? Yeah, it would be the same with me. I think it's just uh, a phenomena to look at the things that are available for us to do. For example, when I moved in here, uh, I had never done any drawing or painting. My mother was quite an artist, but I would never have anything to do with art. And I became involved with the art teacher one day in a conversation, and she invited me to come and, and just give it a try and see how it goes, see how you feel when you try to do some drawing and some painting. And it turns out, uh, it's one of the most delightful things I've ever been involved in and have enjoyed every minute of it. And we have incredibly effective teachers in the art room and they're there Monday through Wednesday and even some people who are residents here offer art at other times. So that, for, for me, has been one of the really delightful opportunities. I did have an interesting experience that I would relate to in that uh, there was a time, because of my background in electronics, I was trying to solve a problem here at Friendship Village. And I came up with about a 50 to 60 percent solution and wrote it up and turned it into the desk. And as I headed back to my room in my magic original Ferrari that I used to ride, <laughs> it occurred to me that the, we have a new director and it was Rita's first day on the job. So I thought, well, it'll be interesting for her to look at that. And I went off down the hall and before I got to the 
elevator, I got a call on my cell phone. And it was Rita. And she said, would you please come back here and come to my office? I want to talk about this problem. So I returned and we met and talked and we worked on that problem for about an hour and she suddenly came up with an amazing solution. And I looked at Rita and I said, you know, it's a shame. You really should be running General Motors and not French <laughs> Village. And Rita said, thank you so much, but I just love it here and I'm staying. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Uh, Seth and Rita, can you share uh, one of your fondest memories with us, please? Um, one of my fondest memories, I know COVID was mentioned with the last panel, but it was right during COVID, we had worked with our friends at the health department, gone round and round to get Alderwood up and running. Um, we had an outbreak on our old health center um, but we finally got the green light to move some so half the residents over to Alderwood. And there was our, all of our leadership team, all of our great staff down in our old health center amongst all the chaos of trying to move 20 people with an outbreak going on. And, and one of the back wings, we had the zip walls. Um, amidst all that chaos, we made like a clap line. And, and as we brought those residents over to their new home across that Alderwood threshold, um, their faces is, is will be one of my fondest memories leaving here. It's just always resonated with me. And um, through all the chaos of COVID and in that moment, um, we had a team there to do, to welcome our residents to their new home, so. I have PTSD from COVID and it makes me very teary eyed. So hearing that it's hard. But mine are two things, one, going through COVID, but also coming out of COVID. And I think really everyone banding together to, you know, I think about the pizza party. Do you guys remember the pizza party in the dining room? We hadn't been together in months and months and months. And I was so nervous because, oh my gosh, we shouldn't be together. But it was just so great to see everyone together. So that was one of my favorites. The second, obviously, is just working with such incredible people. Our leadership team is amazing. I know Jerry talked about it, and he's made some exceptional hires, um, and we've just added to those. So it's, we're just so fortunate to work with so many great people. Thank you so much, Rita. Um, can you tell us... Uh, and this one is maybe more for staff uh, members. Can you tell us about the biggest challenge that you've encountered uh, during your time at FED and, and how you've overcome it? And, and maybe it's COVID and we can talk a little bit more about that or maybe it's something different. Angela. Uh, well, first, I just want to bring up, we've been talking about COVID, but not one person has mentioned the war room that John Schwark had downstairs that had, what was it, Steve, masks, gowns. So not only did he have this like military background, but prepared us for something we would have never thought we would have needed. I, that was like, what? Like Rita called me, I was on partial maternity leave and she said, there's a war room. And I was like, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> like, she's like, let's just say thank you to John Schwark. So I can't believe we're not talking about that. So um, I, I would say uh, one of the, uh, I wanna talk about our, our LCS transition, but in a positive light. So I think honestly, it was like, I'm going to use the analogy, it's like when your kids grow up and they're ready to just fly on their own. We were just really ready, right? And we, it was a hard year because we had a lot of work, but it was for us just the right time to transition and to watch our team sort of flourish. We, we built this group together and we all had this skill set and it was just really cool to see that like what we've put together and the people that we've put in there can now just be capable to sort of fly. So that's been cool. Angela, will you tell us, because if you can believe it, there are people in the room who have not been a part of FED when it's been a part of LCS. Just tell us briefly what LCS is for anybody that needs that context. Sure, so I think Jerry mentioned, you know, they were the group that sort of scoped this out, started to build Friendship Village of Columbus and Friendship Village of Dublin, and they were just basically the overall management partner. So provided support, they could come in and do consultant services, they had some financial conversations so they were just an overarching group that helped sort of guide this way thank you appreciate mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. uh, I think 
the toughest challenge uh, in my five years was a byproduct of COVID was really about a year and a half into the pandemic. I mean, the labor challenges were almost insurmountable. And I spent a lot of my time and efforts here making sure we have the right people in the right places and staffing's appropriate because I'm a big believer that staff satisfaction directly correlates into resident satisfaction. So there was some tough times in, in a couple departments, uh, certainly direct care, culinary, um, where we just did not have the bodies nor the applications to fill those spots. And, you know, working with Rita, we take that, we take that, you know, it, it, yeah, it's, we want to deliver the care and services we, you guys signed up for. And there, there was a good 12 month period where it was bleak and uh, a lot of people stepped up and did a lot of different things that were not, are not in their job descriptions. And um, that's, that's a testament to, to the leadership and, and being here for the right reasons, which is to serve the residents here. So I think that was probably the toughest um, thing here in the last two, three years. I have three. Anybody want to guess? COVID? What is it? Uh, that's not on there. Believing LCS. Well, that's four. What's number two? Master plan. And then I'll piggyback on Seth being labor. So um, COVID, master plan, labor market, and LCS. Thank you, Rita. Um, friends, how do you see... So we have had the distinct pleasure today to hear from many folks who have been a part of Friendship Village since its inception moving forward. Um, how do you see FVD's long and rich history impact, it impacting its operations and your decision making today? Rita, I think that one is primarily for you. I think I said it earlier, you know, I love that Angela brought up the war room because it's just such a great um, analogy for the such solid foundation that John provided to all of us. I mean, we sit in this room because of John Schwartz. Uh, and then Jerry came and kind of put the vision into reality and spent some of John's money. And um, <laughs> he says a lot, but, uh, and then, you know, now we have this foundation and this new building and friendship at home and home care that Jeanette and Seth have brought to reality for us and kind of put some extra wings on it. So I think the future is really, uh, you know, the board is so visionary, you are all so visionary, but we're, we're living in the moment and loving every minute of it with all of you. But we also have to be strategic about what the next generation of residents looks like. John and Jerry did that for you. And so now we kind of get to dream a little bit. I think the Bailey is the next, the next, next step. I think this evolution of friendship at home, really, that Jerry put the foundation in, and it wouldn't surprise me that in the next decade, there will be another Friendship Village of Dublin. We'll see what that looks like. It's nothing in the plan. Don't get all excited. <laughs> but I think when we think about where we are in the industry, Craig talked earlier about the Fitch rating. You know, we're probably two or three years away from that A- minus Fitch rating again. Seth talked about the labor and... The fact that we have survived these last three years and have used agency to the tune of like maybe $25,000 when people are millions and millions and millions of dollars, the work that Seth has done on putting paper to technology and the work that you have all done, and Jeannie and what she's doing with the touchdown and this incredible activity and the vibrancy that her and her team bring us. It's just a really nice foundation for us to just springboard. So I love that the opportunities, when they come knocking, we can open the door. We're in a position to do that. Um, but we have to breathe a little bit because we've been through a lot and we have a lot of things going. So we just need to keep, and the labor market's not going anywhere. So we've got to be a little bit more strategic about that. Rita, you actually started to answer what my last question was for this panel, which is, what's next for FVD? So Angela, I'd like you to answer that um, related to human resources and friends to start your thinking caps, Dick and Lois, I, I wish, um, or I, I hope that you'll tell us, what do you hope from the resident perspective is next for FVD? Angela, we'll start with you. Well, first, I think it's unfair I didn't get to share my favorite memory. Oh, please. Sorry. 
So, <laughs> yes, Lois wants to do that too. Okay, good. We okay. can do that. Thank you. Um, so my memory is very similar to Jerry's, although we've never had the opportunity to meet. Nice to meet you. Um, on my first week, I walked around. I said hello to people. I walked into Don's kitchen. I said hi, and Don came to my office and said, "What are you doing?" And I said, "What? I'm saying hello." He's like. You're scaring my people. If you're going to continue to do that, you need to tell me. And I was like, well, we have a lot to do here. So we are all connected in some way. <laughs> so I think our vision from a human resources standpoint is really we just we need to figure out how to tackle this labor market in, in a different way. We And we've all spoken to it. We have a different type of environment here. Working here means a true partnership, means really being involved and being a part of this community. It's not just a job, it's supporting whole people. And so we need to make that be seen to the external world, because you really don't get to see it until you're in it and you feel it. Thank you, Angela. Okay, Lois, favorite memory. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, Don just talked about the nifty wing and the Nifty Cafe, but he didn't elaborate as to what that was. And the Nifty Wing, so to speak, is now Waterford. And we lived through the tearing down of the Nifty Wing, and we would have chairs sitting all around so that we could see the wrecking ball come out and knock that building down. And then we spent hours watching that, and then we could watch it being rebuilt. But our floor had been connected to that. So there had been a door there. Well, in the meantime of tearing this down, some of the people that worked to go to Riverstone were living on our floor. And one of the ladies had an, had an, an emotional support cat. And when they tore that building down, there were many mice running on our floors <laughs> and up and down the stairways. Well, occasionally we'd see a, a note on this lady's door that would say, Pearly seven, mice zero. <laughs> <laughs> so we welcomed Pearly to be on our floor for a while. And that's my favorite story. Oh, I love it. <laughs> uh, where, well, I, my hope and my dream is that when we get new residents, that we can all go out and welcome them and make it known that we've been here for seven years or 18 years, but we want you to feel welcome. We want you to feel that you can come and sit at our table, that if there's something you wanna get involved in, come and sign up for those committees and get involved because that's been the best thing that I have done at Friendship Village was be involved and make new friends. Thank you so much, Lois. Dick, I'm sorry, I probably didn't give you an opportunity. Do you have a favorite memory that you would like to share? Well, it would be the same one. Uh, okay. For, for me, that, uh, that is so exciting to think about and to be able to continue with the wonderful opportunities that we have living here and the wonderful, wonderful people that we meet each day. and. Two, if we could some way uh, have an opportunity for more of us to meet new residents or potential residents, that would be exciting just to be able to share with them what it feels like and what it is like to live here. Thank you so much. My friends, um, audience members, I'm sorry. Yes, please. I just want to take a moment, and maybe JC's going to do this, but I'm a stealer thunder, um, to have Jerry and Don stand up. Jerry and Don both came from West Coast time to be here today and for us to really show our appreciation for them being here and also their incredible contributions to Friendship Village. So Jerry and Don, if you could please stand up. You did steal my thunder, but I'm very pleased that you did that. Yes, we are so incredibly grateful uh, to, to Jerry and Don for traveling and to all of our panelists for your willingness to share today, to be a part of this. We so appreciate that. Uh, audience members, thank you so much for being here. If we could have one more round of applause for everybody that we saw up on the stage here today. All righty.
And um, friends, One Rita, more. please. Can we also have a round of applause for the Community Life and Wellness team for a super fun week? I heard that you were all dancing last night on the dance floor to We Are Family. Is that true? Ah, oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you to all of them. I know it's a lot of work to put this on, so we're grateful. To Wonderful. All of you. Thank you, Rita. And one more thank you. Uh, um, I wish to thank Betsy Gillespie, uh, who put together the photographs that you all saw uh, on the screen here in the beginning. Uh, she put those together for Light the Way and was so generous to share those with us so that we could show them to you today. Friends, thank you all so much for being here. Grab some lunch. Come back for some video games. Uh, we'll, we'll be so excited to see you for that. Have a fabulous day.